Welcome everyone. This is Glenn Thompson, today's presenter as you see on the screen. Um, happy to be here once again. I guess we had a, a webinar. My last webinar was about three weeks ago and then about a week and a half ago Pacific Trading asked me to present something again this week and I thought it would be appropriate given the election uh, to talk in terms of uh, what the economic uh, landscape looks like in the aftermath of the election, thus the title, Trades to Place in the Aftermath of the Election. For those of you who have not attended previous webinars, uh, you can uh, write comments in on the in the control panel area of the right side of your screen, and as best as I'm able, if I can keep track of the uh, comments and or questions as they come in, and I feel that I can at least uh, uh, continue with a continuous flow of presentation, I'll address them. I should have plenty of time today. I only have two or three uh, really significant salient opportunities, and as such, it should not take long. I always say that and end up going longer, but <clears throat> in any case, uh, I have allocated time at the end of the presentation to, if necessary, fully more fully address any questions you might have, and I welcome them. Again, um, as you see, I, my name is Glenn Thompson. I've been working in the capacity of, as a mentor with Pacific Trading Academy since the beginning, since they started almost 17 years ago. I've been trading 30-some years now, but um, primarily use, utilizing and depending on the technical approach for those of you who are new. Those of you who uh, visited previous programs and webinars uh, pretty much have a sense of the type of things and, and topics I like and my approach in general. But again, if you have questions for whatever reason, please feel free to ask. Also, if you miss any portion or if you'd like to review, I just hit the recording button. So we are recording and we archive all the presentations at, the, uh, at uh, our website. For further information on that, you, can, you need to contact us. You see Pacific Trading Academy, 800-339-8588. Or you can also reach us via the website, www.pacifictradingacademy.com. Peter Newman is the contact person uh, that can get you over there. That's actually hand the archiving of our programs such as this are handled by the computer department. But any general questions, please address to Peter Newman. And again, welcome all of you. Um, it has been what a difference a day or a week makes. Uh, when I was asked to come up with a topic, for um, again, for those of you who have been, who have been uh, here for the previous two or three webinars, I have indicated particularly uh, time points that I had generated for the stock market, and one of them was November 4th, so that was last Friday, and I had derived that date, oh, I don't know, weeks if not months ago, and then it dawned on me as we got closer and closer, you know, as we were, I guess, in the middle of October, that obviously the presidential election was in November, and I couldn't recall the date, and then I realized upon closer examination, it was just uh, two days ago. So uh, I kind of, in my thinking, was grouping my projected time target of November 4 as a, to be a part of. I, in my head, I was considering the 11-4, which was last Friday, time point to be a the, the starting point, the bookend, if you will, of a window of time that would end on, say, the 8th, between 11 for last Friday and this past Tuesday, uh, taking into account the obvious scheduled major event uh, uh, for, you know, in, our, in, in the world, actually, not just the U.S. Uh, and I think that was a fairly accurate, uh, I'm pretty certain. Um, so let's take a look and uh, I'll try as much as possible to give you some context to present the particular trade scenarios and investment situations I see are high probability uh, going forward in the kind of uh, wake of what has happened politically uh, this week. Uh, let's slide that. Uh, I have in the le since the election, even uh, even on Tuesday during the course of the day, or since actually to be back it up a little further, since the beginning of this week, I have been bombarded with people with questions uh, of uh, people that I consult in trading uh, of, of past and present and all over the place in terms of what to make and so forth. About two weeks ago, I was a, a panelist on a radio broadcast, and kind of as a softball question, at the end of the qu set of questions, they asked each one of us, who do we think was going to win the election? And then the follow-up to that was, 
what effect would it have on the market? My response was, and it's and um, and it still remains. Uh, uh, my thinking is the same. I had no, I, I didn't have an idea. I kind of had a thought who would win. Um, I ended up being wrong on that. But here's where I was. Uh, what I the bigger point I wanted to make because I, coming from a vantage point of technical analysis. Uh, in terms of how I work up and generate my projections and forecasts, um, I concomitant with that view is this idea that there will always be situations, events, um, things that occur in the world of in our in our world our daily life that serve as triggers or catalysts to bring about what I believe on very deep levels. I believe from a uh, and vis-a-vis -vis this slide that time periods specific amounts of time elapse uh, are somehow in some ways of which I have clarity for other uh, ways I'm not completely I don't understand the cause and effect chain of events but I believe at very deep levels cyclical time elapse components are responsible in a cause and effect standpoint uh, for all of the price changes or what we call price returns that we see in a stock a bond or in, in any financial system um, and if it and so it happened, uh, the obvious um, event that has imputed a great deal of volatility into the financial markets, in particular, uh, in the U.S. and worldwide, in fact, because of our connections in the world today, uh, was the election. If it weren't that, it would be would have been something or things else. It would have been some other events or event that would have served to. Uh, correspond to uh, what I believe on deeper levels and specifically I, I think the underlying very deep uh, uh, seminal uh, phenomena that is responsible for all price action and admittedly this is an extreme view is the passage of time. Timing should always take and as such this is a my credo of analysis timing should always take precedence over price Now I realize this is not a popular view it's not the generally agreed upon consensus there are very few traders I always tell the people that I work with and instruct and have for years very few traders incorporate and consider time uh, uh, issues related to the temporal dimension I call it the neglected axis of price or market behavior um, I believe I'm one of them, and I take it to an extreme vis-a-vis -vis people like W.D. Gann and Jensen and more and Robert Krauss, and more recently people like Larry Pesavento, Michael Jenkins, um, Robert Miner to some extent. I think more and more people are, but it's the approach that I take. I am not oblivious to price, but I think price is, is, is symptomatic of underlying currents of uh, uh, moments ticking off of a clock, to be precise. So... Um, the confusion that often presents when we uh, place too great a focus, I think, on superficial topical events, and I admit it, it, it's certainly confusing. I, ironically, I started my career uh, more than 30 years ago attempting to make good objective decisions and reach uh, uh, clarity in terms of locating good trades solely on the events, a fundamental approach. I'm not against the fundamental approach at all. Um, it's just that I don't have whatever sufficient to make sense of all of the myriad complexity of possible phenomena that, that occurs on the level that we refer to and, and apply analytics to uh, that we, in, in a general sense, refer to um, in, a, in a big group as fundamental approach. Um, it's a daunting task. Instead, I always start by the charts, looking at both price and time, work up a, a view, a projection, a plausible scenario. That, Given that scenario, I attempt to pay attention and maintain a lookout for the type of events that would occur day by day in our world that circulate in our daily existence, i.e. what we refer to as fundamentals, to see if I see those types of things that are occurring or might be setting up that are consistent and might as such align with my scenarios that I've generated primarily from a price and time standpoint. So that's just a quick overview to give you a sense for those of you who have not heard me uh, present, present ideas before, the approach I take. Um, I am certainly going to incorporate, I'm not going to stand in front of a, like the old uh, cliche, a, an oncoming freight train in terms of a big event that is so overwhelming it imputes an amount of energy to move a market. Usually, though, those items are 
are a, a relative blip in terms of the uh, duration and the persistency. Uh, more persistent, more uh, the, the, the phenomena that are create more persistent uh, superficial effects in the market are those that are more deeply embedded, such as time cyclical uh, elapses. And as such, that's why I, that's typically my starting point. Money flows towards greatest rates of return. Well, that's certainly an inner market. Uh, kind of just fundamental financial concept. So I want to take that into account when I, uh, as, and I have, I, I believe, uh, given my selection of what I think right at this moment in the immediate wake of our election uh, or represents some high probability entries. This is just another, this is not strict, this is certainly not the technical. It represents in a little more detail just a schematic illustrating some of the obvious inter-market or inter-economy uh, relationships among some of the major capital market sectors, the bonds, the stocks, our U.S. currency. Um, and so starting, you could say, and you could take that back further, I didn't on this slide, but you could say what determines the behavioral uh, state, the current state and the trajectory of the U.S. dollar. Well, GDP, uh, imports, exports, taxation, all sorts of economic uh, componentry in the economy creates the eventual uh, behavior that we see in the dollar, but in turn, uh, all of you know, I'm, uh, this slide de uh, depicts a, uh, the dollar as being the independent variable and commodities, bonds, and stocks being dependent on the fluctuations we see there. In general, rising strength, strength strong currency puts pressure on you know, the commodities in a general sense, correspondingly lifts and supports stocks and bonds. When you're going through a period, now that's the normal relationship and the opposite is the case. You've got the mirror image. When dollar values decline, commodities tend to be buoyed up, bonds tend to decline and so do so too do stocks. There are a number of additional ancillary um, other inter-sector relationships. Bonds in general tend to lead stocks. In general, there are exceptions to that, but we often, I think of bonds as a lead, as the treasury market, in, treasury instruments as leading um, uh, equity prices simply because bonds are most directly uh, connected or impacted and sensitive to monetary policy, which in turn is a major component of determining U.S. dollar or the currency values. Um, I always say if one is trading currencies or a forex trader in a very global macro sense as a starting point, as a backdrop, and this is purely fundamental, um, ask yourself if, the, if a given country were to issue stock, just consider that its stock would be its currency. So as, the, as, as a country or a sovereign state fares, so too you can expect in the macro view its currency to fare. Okay. Um, so this is just a general uh, schematic that gives us a starting point by which we can uh, uh, interpret some of the relationships in an economy. And as, but it's purely a starting point. And then we'd have to overlay into this or superimpose events that are, are, are multi-sigma, such as an election like we've had uh, this week. All right. Okay. So I have been, I got uh, just about two weeks ago, went long in the bond market, and last week complemented that with a corresponding on the shorter end of the curve, went long in the T-note market, 10-year note. Um, so obviously, well, I got, I was stopped out. You can see what's been happening. You might say, well, why am I going long when clearly the trend is down? Clearly since the top here, if you can see the pointer, let me just slide this so you have a little more sense of where we are. This is a daily chart of the 30-year Treasury, and this top back is July 6. We have been declining and in decline since that point. I believe that this top corresponds to the end of a fifth wave. Let me stop right there. I, I, I want to I wanna keep everyone or as much of my audience with me as I possibly can. I'm making reference to uh, a, a, a just price descriptive model, Elliott principle. For those of you familiar, great. For those of you who are not aficionados or who don't know what I'm referring to. It's simply a model, very ubiquitous. It's very well known. Uh, some people can't stand it. Some people love it. And others have views all in the spectrum between. But suffice it to say, it's a model that uh, merely uh, provides a, 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 a framework within which we can view and interpret price action. Um, it says that all bull markets or when or those phases when a market's rising, what we refer to as a bull, 
takes place in a set of five ways, and then it's followed subsequently by a bear market, which breaks up into three ways. Um, so if you have a five-wave advance, here's one, if you can see that. This is two. Uh, this is three. This is four. And then up to the top, I believe, is a fifth wave. I believe. Now, is that absolute certainty? No. But if, if, there's, if using that as a starting point, then the reason I might, if I'm trying to understand uh, what it is that a market's doing and why it might be doing it, for the purpose of anticipating what it might do going forward into the future, i.e. a trade. Um, it, it might be helpful to the extent I can work up an explanation as to why a market has done what it's done, for, given a certain look back into the past through the present, and to the extent I have confidence in my view, I might similarly have a, a similar degree of confidence in how I can expect it will move forward going uh, in a uh, uh, just a kind of an extrapolated or a transposed projection out into time, into the future. But I believe that the top here, this is July 6th, if you can see the calendar, I didn't, I ran out of time last night, folks, when I was putting the presentation together, so forgive me for not having a little more explicit detail, but you can trust me, this is July 6th, I have this in my head, I look at these 24-7, but, and we've been coming down, and again, this would be the bare portion of, a mar of an eight-way cycle that is a component of a very prevalent model, L. Elliott principle. One, two, three, or ABC rather is the bare component. I believe that we are either at that end or nearly so, and that I believed it two weeks ago. Otherwise, I would not have gone long. I believe, it, and that corresponds with this bottom here and this bottom. Well, you can see I was wrong. And money management always trumps uh, theory in my estimation because we're here for at the end of the day in an effort to maximize our ROI, return on investment, obviously. So the key um, to integrate a component of that, you know, I forgot the guy, the guy, former head of Bear Stearns used to say the way to make a fortune in investing is be wrong, uh, be, take a lot of small losses, be wrong quick and get and be wrong often, but make sure that your wrongness uh, and from a reward risk standpoint, are quite small as a percentage of the funds, total funds that you're working with, your resources to play with. All it takes is a few winning trades to offset the previous loses, losses, and then some. So easier said than done, but it is a, a critical component to be successful in investing and trading. But here's a thought: going forward, that's the past. I got stopped out, and I'm going to present what I believe to be compelling evidence as to why. Not at this moment, but very soon. I told someone this early, or earlier today, before today's presentation, who got stopped out similar. And my first and foremost consideration is, as a percentage of equity, what's your, what's your, what was your deficit? What was the debit against account equity? That's critical. Okay, but here's the thought. Where are we going with this? You can see we're still in decline. This, this is a slide I printed, printed out last night. We are lower today than we are in the evening session last night. Went right about 15 minutes before I tuned in. I don't. The last quote I had for the bonds, the 30-year Treasury December contract, 155.28. Let me show you, folks, if you can see. As of last night, we were at 158 and change. Right about 15, 20 minutes ago, we were trading at 155. So we've had further declines in today's trade. Okay, uh, the regular session just closed a little while ago, I believe. Yeah, uh, just 22 after the hour. So we've just closed in the day session. It, I think there's a, a little break and then the overnight session commences. But here's my thought. Uh, I think we are either, if with yesterday's low, or, or excuse me, today's low, um, we are either at a what I, I believe will be the end of the ABC three-wave correction, the bear market portion of an eight-wave cycle, and as such the start of a new cycle. Or if we are not, we I believe based on a series of different relationships and factors very, very close to it. And as such, one of the trades I want to present to you for your consideration and, and reflection is establishing a long position in uh, the treasury instruments, whether you trade the bonds, the notes. Uh, right now, um, I, was in, I was long in both and again got stopped out in the last few sessions. All right. Um, right now, of the two, if you're going to trade the 10-year notes, let's say, versus the 30-year, I, I would prefer the 10-year note for reasons that I'll elaborate on in, in a subsequent slide. 
However, if you are, and now if you're on if you trade stocks and on the security side, an ETF such as TLT uh, is a fund for which you would you could buy options and uh, would be an appropriate mapping or translation for the underlying if you're not trading a, a derivative. But in principle, just for the uh, that this initial slide says, in, from a contrarian standpoint, even though we see it sliding, and I'm saying we even declined further today, here's what I want you to get out of this slide. By, for a couple of reasons, price and time, mo everyone who has been who is worth their salt analytically uh, works at price, and we want to establish all sorts and and be cognizant of all sorts of relevant price relationships that will give us an indication as to the current state of a market and its future extrapolated state, how we expect it will move going forward in time. Okay. That's obvious, and I, I and yes, the, the primary premise of the of the technical paradigm is price discounts all information, and I am clearly an adherent to that. I just add something to it. I add the complementary information that time period analysis generates and derives for me when it does. Okay, but here's let me start by price. What are these horizontal lines I've drawn in? Well. There are basically a number of one of the details. I don't intend to get into the specifics and all of the nuts and bolts of a particular model, i.e., in this case, Elliott principle. But it suffices to say there are basic um, types of ways, cookbook ways, if you will. There are basically four of them, ways or patterns by which we can interpret the type of ABC correction that is occurring. If you look at everything from the top here, which again, for those of you who are uh, conversant with Elliott Wave, I believe is a particular fifth wave. If you look at the weekly charts and so on and monthly and look at the different degrees, I believe this is a smaller degree within a larger degree fifth wave. But suffice it to say, at the end of any given fifth wave of any size, scale, or degree, you have an ABC uh, component, a, a retracement. And I believe everything since then is that. I could be wrong. And so a lot of what, so I want to be forthright, I am not uh, absolutely certain, but I have, I would say I'm 90% certain the top that came in July, middle, uh, uh, back in July, uh, July 6, depending on which instrument, I think it's, uh, depending on if it's the notes, it might be a day off or the ETF on TLT, but more or less a couple of days after the 4th of July, we had a top in treasury instruments across, regardless of the 10 year, the 30 year bills, et cetera, or in even a fund that tracks that TLT, TBT, et cetera. They all topped out in and around that first week or so in July and have been in decline since. And I construe and interpret all of that price decline since the middle of July or the first week in July as an ABC bear market correction. That's all. The question is, when is it over? Well, again, previously I thought it was over back with this bottom and I've been wrong twice in the last two weeks. Here's why I believe if we're not over, we are close to it. If the type of correction that we've the type of price pattern we've seen since this top uh, most closely is adhering to what we refer to as a zigzag. There is a flat, there's irregulars, there's triangulars, there's zigzags. Those are the major types of patterns by which a corrective portion of a market cycle theoretically should form. This is just theory. I'm not suggesting the real world is a perfect replica of theoretical constructs. It does provide us a framework of interpretation when it does. And so this is a pretty decent uh, approximation and adherence to a theoretical idea. This would, and so ABC are the three components of the bear market. I submit all the price drop down to this bottom indicated by this upper horizontal line is your A wave. The move up to here, that's about a 50 to um, between a 50 and a 61 percent retracement. That is a particular attribute uh, peculiar to a zigzag, the degree of the B wave. And in this, is the C. Well, another feature peculiar to zigzags is that the A and the C theoretically should be equal. Theoretically. Well, if that is the start, using that as a starting point of interpretation, if you just measure the distance, what's the price de delta from the top here, the start of the A wave down to the end of the A wave? You measure that and you project that or displace it from the start of the C. And that's going to give you this lower horizontal. 159 is my theoretical price target if this were to, if in fact, there are two assumptions that are implicit in my line of thought here. Number one, everything we're seeing from the top in July through where we are right now is in fact an ABC correction. That's number one. 
It's an assumption. It's not, I don't know that with absolute certainty, but I believe it to be the case. And secondly, that the type of correction we're seeing is that of uh, most closely thought to be or interpreted or defined as a zigzag, labeled as a zigzag. If both of those assumptions are correct, well, in, in the real, in a theoretical textbook, you would expect the C and the A to be equal. And as such, you would expect the end of the C to be in and around the 159 area. Well, I just said at least 15 minutes ago, we were trading just above, you know, just below 156 on the axis. So you can see where that is because we had a further decline today. Yesterday in the evening session, that's that little white candle here, you, we were higher and then we, had, we commenced the decline or we repeated or accelerated the decline. We're trading just below 156 probably unless something drastic happened in the last 30 minutes. All right. So my point is, I believe if the market, and that, that's not egregious, we're, in, we're still in the vicinity from a price perspective of what theory tells us a zigzag should look like. But the lower the market goes, the further it, it moves away from theoretical standard of reference, the more probable I expect that we're going to reverse and turn around so as to get back in sync with a theoretical attractor, if you will. And that's, my, that's one factor. I have another expectation based, that's one reason why from a price vantage point, I expect if not immediately, soon, we will be reversing purely based on one relationship. And that is the tendency of the structural tendencies peculiar to one generic type of corrective pattern. Based on that and assessing where the real, comparing the real world with theory, I, that leads me to conclude woefully insufficient of placing the trade, but it's one component that would argue for the case of uh, sooner than later expecting a reversal of trend. I have many other components that would amass and, and aggregate build a stronger case to suggest a reversal is imminent. Okay, now what's another uh, component? I did a, I have a, uh, this is the RSI, the relative strength oscillator. I have two notices we're coming down. I, uh, this is a, a little esoteric technique that um, forgot the guy who developed this, but Connie Brown, I'm going to give credit. Connie Brown learned it from, I cannot recall the person who, Wells Wilder developed the oscillator here, but he did not develop this little measuring technique or price targeting technique. Suffice it to say, during any portion when you have a falling trend, like you do here, and you have a succession of lower tops, Here's a top and then a lower top as the market evolves forward through time or as we cast our gaze from left to right. But notice the RSI. You move for the similar top, and I drew this to graphically illustrate you have a top and a higher top. It allows us to do a price target projection. I take values from the two tops and I project them off of this bottom. And in doing that, I get a price target of 163.12. Well, let's see where that is. 163 is right here. That's com utilizing this relation. I'm kind of reverse engineering. I'm allowing, I'm generating a plausible target given the relationship of, of motion between the RSI oscillator and price. And my price target, and, and by the way, I could, one could have done this. So if you're familiar with this technique, you could have done it at any point after this second top had formed. So that's back there in the first week of October. October 3, October 4, I could have generated a price target to tell me how much further decline I could expect in this market. Now notice, in the first week of October, we're trading up at 170 area, between 169 and 170, if you can align the current price levels where at that point in time in first week of October with where the vertical axis over here. 169 to 170, and at that time, which would have been the earliest you could have done it because you needed to see and wait until this top had formed and then the corresponding higher top in the RSI, at that time, my price target was 163.12 to be precise. So let's see where that is, just above the 163. So that's a more conservative price target, not perfect. I would have loved to tell you it was perfectly aligned with this horizontal 159. Not all, that's what you look for. You won't always get very, very different ideas or relationships or models or systems deriving uh, the same exact output. When they do, you really pay attention, but uh, analytically, that's meaningful, at least in a qualitative sense. But nevertheless, here's, what it, well, here's my takeaway. 
we generated a target by a completely separate tar uh, technique of 163.12, significantly higher than the more ambitious target of 159. My bigger point is, in either case, the market has transcended and exceeded both of those price targets on the downside. How much more? And so I've got, I've done two other techniques I, for time reasons. I, one is Fibonacci and one is based on a harmonic idea. By all four techniques that I'm thinking of that I put together just in the last few days uh, for, for purposes of indicating and confirming my idea, then my sense that from a, at least from a contrarian view, I'm expecting we are either at a bottom with today's low or we are nearly so. Okay, so that's a price argument. I have four different things at minimum to ex uh, based on price, pure technicals, to suggest we're either at a bottom or close to it, and as such, correspondingly, should soon expect a reversal to the upside. Now, another interesting thing we could do, especially and I, from a practical standpoint, when when the uh, rubber meets the road, if I if you have been if you previously were long. And I, as I was, I want to I want to filter my entry. I'm not so I may be a little gun shy given the deficit or debiting of my equity of late. So well, here's an obvious. I'm not I, whatever. Look at the RSI. This is as of last night, and it's still below the traditional standard 30 in oversold territory. At minimum, even if and when I do, I feel I have amassed sufficient evidence to establish a long position. Play the play the reversal. At minimum, I might require that this oscillator, which is in a generic state of oversold, might move up out of that territory to filter an entry, play it a little more conservative. Uh, conservative. So anyone, even if you are convinced that you should establish a long position, and I'm not saying you should do now, uh, I think it would be contingent on filtering, clearly, given the, uh, because the argument, uh, the obvious argument, let me not overlook, uh, miss out in, um, bypass the obvious. The momentum and the inertia built up in this move uh, is, is you don't want to uh, give that insufficient uh, weighting. It is clearly, uh, it takes a few things to start turn a system that has built up a an energetic head of steam in a sense, and that's what this market has done. Um, it's it, that, that's a momentum and, and a crest of momentum. So I want to take that into account. Um, I've actually been more successful over the years trading a pure trend and, and exploiting pure trend than everything else I know put together. However, uh, to for the purpose of locating and taking into account bigger macro investing ideas such as uh, the awareness that financial markets are not in the business of rewarding the obvious, we want to look in some places and, and, and enforce some relationships that are maybe beneath the surface and not so um, pre presentable. And I do believe this is one uh, that is um, uh, a potential opportunity that a lot of traders are going to miss. Uh, the obvious fundamental factor, or it not so obvious, I think there are two reasons why, because I was telling people last week, regardless of the outcome of the big event this week, the presidential election, the bonds would rise. Because the Fed last week, from a, again, this is a fundamental count, I, can't, I don't live be, in beneath a rock, I'm aware of what's going on. The Fed as I, as most analysts surmised, did not raise rates. We were not expecting by any, unless something dramatic happened, it would have been a precedent in a sense that the Fed raised rates. Similarly, there's, I would have over 90, probably over 95% expectation, barring some type of economic, world global catastrophe, the Fed will raise rates middle of December. That's going to happen based on uh, hewing to the odds and probabilities, clearly. All right. So, that the reason, the reason fundamentally, if I might cite one, an obvious one, bonds are declining. If we, if one is interested, and I am certainly interested in every information, all bits and pieces of information that I think will help me make money. Um, bad news, good news is bad for the bonds. So the market, and this is the going full circle back to the question that was put to all the panelists in a radio broadcast a couple of weeks ago. Who do you think is going to win the election, and how will the economic, the market, the financial market, and market and financial community in general respond? Well, I said I don't know, but I did know this, with over 90% certainty. Whoever the whatever the outcome of the presidential election would be, 
the financial, the stock market in particular in the United States would find it, would, would rally on it and be favorable. And we're correct. I did not, I got to be completely honest here, I did not anticipate the amount. I knew it would be volatile. I didn't expect it would be as volatile. Uh, the, see the uh, dispersion of price within the relatively short period of time that we did. I'm not surprised, but I didn't expect, I am somewhat, I'm more, just the magnet, the sheer magnitude surprised me. But the fact that there was volatility certainly didn't, but the amount in the confined, compressed period of time was a little more than I had expected. Nevertheless, I am, I was, my forecast for the stock market was perfect, and I'll tell you why based in a, in a minute. And that all ties into why I am bullish on the on the Treasury instrument sector. I am, and but if in my effort in the last few sessions to understand why the market moved against my long position, well, all I can say in a macro way of interpreting it, the bonds are don't re, are pressure uh, the nominal bond prices in Treasury instruments. Are, are, are pressured when they good when they, when there's good things when there's a general consensus of good. However, whatever one might define that to be, that uh, that puts pressure on bonds. And the opposite is the case when bad news happens. So if the stock market, by intermarket can correlate corollary, might uh, have responded just you know not so favorably if it hadn't been rallying since the uh, the other, the events of the election, um, I would expect the bonds would also. Uh, be significantly higher. Um, the running story, I guess, that I've heard, someone had to call me and inform me that they, with the uh, Trump presidency, there is an expectancy of uh, constructionism and maybe potential heating up of potential inflation. I guess that's the idea. So that would be the reason why, a reason. Uh, but good news is um, bad news for bonds, bad news is good news for bonds. So in a broad sense, for whatever reason, you might say just globally thinking of in the macro term, you know, the bond market currently at the moment, given its anticipation of there, I, I don't think it's specifically, uh, I think it's the outcome of the election more so than the fact that we've got a, the Fed meeting in the middle of next month and that they're going to raise rates. Because that would have, I don't know that that itself, um, the fact that there was a delay would have still been uh, a component that would have served to continue to buoy as we at least till we got to the middle of this month. So that be, that's a side, that's my fundamental take. But I've given, we've got basically the point that the slide illustrates is we want to consider that we are either at from a price vantage point of interpreting things a bottom or close to it. Because I've got four different price targets, all of which the market has exceeded. Now is that saying it's definitive? No, I'm not again saying we can't decline further. That's why before I establish a long, I'm going to which, but I am clearly waiting for that opportunity of trend reversal. And as a final uh, filter, I'll be looking at things such as wa watching my standard oscillator set, whether you look at stochastic, RSI, etc., breaking out of the extreme territory and breaking up into neutral territory, at, among other filters that I might use. The specifics of entry should reflect a host of variables that define more precisely who you are as an investor and a market participant. Money management, emotional tolerances, your your favored instruments that serve as caveats for entry. But clearly, you want to do that. But in principle, I want to present a qualitative high probability trade idea. And I am, and so for those I consult, uh, the moment I, and I would be establishing long positions, at least I anticipate such, uh, once I see price action that suggests uh, that move, it's, I, I'm seeing a manifestation of the things I'm indicating um, in the direction of motion that the analysis projects, um, I will indicate such, but I will be trading the, tra the T note for another reason that I have yet to mention. Okay, so that's, this is some evidence from a price standpoint. One other point I forgot. From a time standpoint, I, I, for, I didn't mark it on the chart, but it is the case. I have a time point specific to the treasury markets, bonds and notes, all uh, wherever you are on the, on the interest rate curve, both the shorter term and the longer term, intermediate, whatever. In this case, it's a geometric relationship, so it's less dependent on the actual maturity of the instrument we're trading. Again, my favorite instrument would be T notes, if you can trade derivatives. If not, if you're on the securities, do TLT. I'm looking at establishing long positions in an interest rate nominal, I mean, with the expectancy of nominal appreciation in the price of those instruments. But I haven't done it yet because we're still declining. I at least need 
some price evidence to indicate we're moving in alignment with the trend. But here's the other important point I should have indicated. I, I didn't mark a graphic line. My time component re relative to what I said. A market's going to do what it's going to do only once its time has come. Let me reiterate the uh, the uh, 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 that's a pillar of my analysis. I if I so I my next time projected target for this market, particular to the specific to the bonds and the notes and the and the treasury instruments, is the 16th of November, which is a week from yesterday, next Wednesday. So. That's one possible reason. I am not, I honestly say, it may be. I don't know this. If we start going up by tomorrow, I'm going to go long. If I see uh, a, satisf a satisfying of the particular set of criteria that will serve as appropriate filters, and I see price action and a confluence of all the components that I feel are appropriate to establish a long position, I will do so. But I am saying I have projected a long time ago, I had a time target for November 16, specific to the bonds and the interest rates. So it's possible what that it, it's possible that, that that time target is going to correspond to the end of the current regime. I don't know that for certain, but it's certainly plausible given what we're seeing. And as such, I would, if that turns out to be the case, my takeaway of interpretation, my way to com my commentary on that would be, ah. The market came down for as far as it did for as long as it did because at, that was the particular period of time uh, after which it was, it was due. It, was, it, uh, it's, it ended one regime, enough energy, fact, and I would be expecting some event or series of things to occur around, at or around the point in time that serves on the level of observation that those who call them and think of themselves and utilize the fundamental approach uh, interpret. Uh, they would say, oh, you know, the Fed comes out next week with an unexpected decision, even though they're not scheduled to meet till the middle of next month. Uh, and says, oh, we're, we, or a report comes out, or something happens, uh, it, it always will. It suffice it to say there will always be something, event, or a series of events, which in the net uh, serves as the, on the level of what we call fundamentals, to be uh, the catalyst or uh, pusher or mover of what technically at deeper levels we have already presaged and forecasted and projected. Okay, if it, if it works, none of this works perfectly, but I have about an 80% um, expectation or 80% reliability in my time target for next week. Whether it will correspond to a top or a bottom, I don't know. I am allowing for the possibility it might be a bottom, in which case, given that added run time, I would expect that the market could go lower. As such, I, all the more, I don't want to establish a long position. Someone said, what about going short? You could, but given how far we've come and more precisely stated how long we've run since the first week of July and our closer, relatively closer proximity to my next important projected time point next Wednesday, that's a higher risk probability. If you're a shorter term horizon trader from, you know, you know it's all relative, then it might be a viable trade. It's not one I would take at the moment if I'm thinking of it in the context of a swing trade or a position trade. If I'm day trading, that's a completely different story. But given where how much time has elapsed with respect to my next high probability time point next Wednesday, I would be a little hesitant or reluctant to establish in par and trade and exploit the downside. You could, and you might make money, because I am saying this: if if that if that's how it will work out, that the end that the run time in the market will respond to next Wednesday. It would indicate, you know, I would ask myself, how far could this thing go? At least in a to the extent there's some linear response. Uh, in proportionality given the amount of time and the corresponding amount of distance it could move along the price axis. Okay, Barring that, I'll watch and see, and, um, and I might, it, so it's possible, and I'll look to exploit a turnaround uh, between now and then. All right, so that is November 16, particular to the Treasury instruments. So that is one obvious and blatant factor that could suggest further declines. We'll see. All right, here's the other, here's another piece of information. This is the T-note chart. It's the same, just a shorter end of the spectrum. And what is I find particularly bullish about this chart, even though the obvious, I don't want to not, I, wanna, I don't want to give short shrift to the obvious. The trend is clearly down. It has been since July, middle of 
first week of July here, the top here. However, look at this commitment of traders report. Look at that COT. The red line represents commercial net positioning. The blue line represents the small traders, what we call small specs. We have a very odd and rare relationship between the two sectors. For those of you familiar with this, it's a government accounting that is, uh, they, it comes out every Friday. Um, most, so we typically notice that the red line is at their largest net long position since the end of July. You see this bottom here, if you can track that, and it's been rising in the net through the largest net long, just off the largest net long position they've been in for the last, more than eight months. But since the end of July through today, the commercials currently in the last report, we'll get a new one tomorrow, uh, are at establishing their largest net long. That in and of itself is nominally bullish. Now, what to, how do you may reconcile that with the trend? The market's going down. You might say, well, why is that? If it's bullish, well, so what? The market's going down. That price is certainly more important. That is the reality of what's happening. Yeah, we interpret the commercials as a leading harbinger or indicator of what's to come. The question is, what's the lag time? What's the amount of lead? Well, that's where we have uncertainty, and often we have to incorporate other factors along with the commercial. Here's what's important. Rarely you see... Um, the small traders, that's the blue line. If you can see, it's the lowest of the three lines. We've got a red up at the top, green in the middle, blue at the bottom. Rarely do you see more of that, that type of symmetrical relationship existing in terms of the net positioning relative to the commercials, which is the red line again, and the small traders, which is the blue line. More frequently, the position occupied by the small traders, as you see in the right now, is what's more frequently occupied by the the large institutional money, green line. And so we have a, a very uh, rare, um, very infrequent occurrence. When that happens, it serves almost as a timing trigger to indicate whatever it is the nominal position on the part of the commercials is, it's about to happen if it already hasn't. So that's a strong piece of evidence, though, you know, again, insufficient by itself to compel me to consider establishing long positions. It's so easy to get swept along with what's occurring. I'm not saying you shouldn't, but I'm not saying you should. There are times when going with the trend, it, it's be, that's a market maxim, trade with the trend. And the, the, the issue there is until it ends. So when you build up an amount of contrary contingency evidence to suggest that at any given point the time is up, I would submit this is another, completely different from the price factors. This is a relationship you maybe see 10% of the time for any given market, if that much. It's much rare. It might even be rarer than that. You might see this once or twice in, in, a, in a year and a half to two years for any given market. Very rare. 95% of the time, you have whatever it is that the commercials are doing, you have the large, the green line, polar opposite. Whenever you have a mirror symmetry between the positioning of the commercials with respect to the small traders. Why is this, by the way? It, it, it's a strong indication uh, you add more, you attach greater importance to whatever the net position of the commercials. Well, commercials are, they're, are, uh, they're supplying or responsible for between, you know, about 70, 80 percent of all the volume, number one. Number two, these people down here, those small traders, are wrong 80 to 90 percent of the time. So if they are polar opposite position, and they're wrong almost for sure. Now, 85, 90% is not guaranteed. But again, in my analysis, you play the odds, you go with the, uh, the numbers. And when those two, and then this is so relatively infrequent a relationship, I want to pay attention. Would it by itself, as compelling as it might the numbers indicate, be sufficient for me to go long in notes or treasuries? No. But again, in aggregate, stacked up, uh, building a body of evidence of different types, I'm, I'm strengthening my argument for establishing long positions in nominal treasuries. I would also tell you, in the biggest decline, notice this big, this is the election, this is the, the, the uncertainty and the volatility that that uncertainty injects into the, sec, into the instrument. Okay. Um, look, at the, look at this lavender line. Look at that open interest decline. That's telling me that most of this is, that's fear. 
that's a graphic representation. That purple line is open open interest, and that's telling me it's telling me something very specific. At least it's not telling me what to do. It's telling me why the market came down. There are many. There are a couple of different ways, and sometimes it can be helpful to create a finer distinction in your head as to why a market's doing what it's doing. There are two ways a market could decline in a broad in the net. One, new selling, or two longs, previously existing longs getting out. The fact that, look at this price fund to free fall and so too, commensurate with that, so too did open interest. Declining open interest telling me I immediately know that this decline in price was not due to new sellers coming in, which if it were, would be more bearish implicitly. No question. The fact that the open interest is declining with the price decline is an indication it's a shorter lived phenomena. Those are, those are the longs getting out. Well, Obviously, I would too. It, they're running to the hill. They're running to the sidelines because to the extent they stay in, unless you can, but en masse, that's a graphic of what, why. And now, the volume, I got to be honest, the volume was high. So that's price supportive. The higher the volume, that, did, that was a bearish indication. But the, what happened? So it's a mixed read there. But I did want to point that out. A collapse in open interest commensurate with a price collapse is at least it it doesn't negate the fact that the price fell apart it fell out of bed it did however it's by way of explanation it could be more bearish and it would have been more bearish if you had seen an attendant commensurate rise in open interest because that would have clearly indicated new sellers were coming in and that tends to be establishing new positions tend to be a, tends to be a more durable persistent phenomenon than a liquidation and this was clearly this has been for the last few sessions in the middle of this week, liquidation type, which I'm not, it's fear. Fear is a, uh, is a more, the most prevalent force as uh, an emotion, uh, as a generator of what we see in the markets. All these charts are just graphic representations of fear and are in the extreme avarice or greed. Fear is even more potent than, than our need for generating return. So this is another argument I, this, especially the commitment of traders, the fact that this is at an extreme, the largest net long, and that's by itself somewhat bullish. But really what sets us apart is I see this rare, relatively, you know, 5 10% of the time, if that much, you have this relationship where the small tra uh, traders are mirror image positioned. Uh, so that's an indication that sooner than later we're going to, I can expect a reversal in the treasury instruments. So that's a trade. Again, if you if you see it, filter your entry and by as a caveat of uh, you know exercise your uh, trade sizing. I'm not going into the details of all that, but money management protocol should be attended to whatever decisions you make and all of that. But it just in generally uh, just as a general opportunity, I believe I will by this time uh, by the middle of next week I would be amazed if I'm not long once again in the in the treasury market. All right, that's one opportunity. This is just for fun. I wanted to throw in something, and this is not in direct consequence to the uh, events of this week, the election, and as such, it's off the beaten path of the, uh, on the economic terrain. Also, just a further qualifying caveat for, uh, of concern to make sure OJ is notoriously illiquid. So only those traders who understand that um, and who can tolerate the degree of Volatility, very illiquid. Sometimes I look at it, um, it's a cost-benefit. If you believe the opportunity is sufficiently large to overwhelm whatever uh, average risks are, uh, and especially if they're greater than average. But again, utilizing a technique that the uh, two slides ago I indicated where I've generated a price target, notice what we're doing. This is, I believe, also a fifth wave of a particular degree. And we're having a little bit of a correction. I put up some obvious Fibonacci's, 38, 50, 61, your, fit, your, your degrees of retracement. Notice we're, we're basically the same today. OJ, you can see last night when I printed this out, we were at 216.20. Um, we're at 216.80 about 40 minutes before I started today's presentation, or actually about 20 minutes, yeah, just about 40 minutes ago, 216.80. So not much change. So if you like buying pullbacks, uh, and what I'm essentially referring to, and I think the opportunity here is a long position in OJ, okay? Um, 216.80, if you, if you like or prefer the pullbacks, you have your levels of corresponding uh, where you'd put your buy limits 
at the 38 if it breaks through the 50, one of those. If it goes down there, only watch out, you know, watch for your 78.6 Fibonacci level, for those of you who know what, you know, I'm talking about. Um, or, now my price target, to be specific in orange juice, is 235. And what did I, and I used a similar uh, little trick, a uh, little sneaky trick. Notice what we have here. All this time the market's rising. I still interpret the market to be in a bull's phase. But you had a bottom and a higher bottom. You had a bottom corresponding to the RSI and a lower bottom. And I did a little manipulation that I teach people that I, you know, and it's a, I would say it's about 80% uh, reliable target in price. And my target again is 235. We're trading at 216, again, about 40 minutes ago, almost an hour, 216.80. So uh, when I mark that in on that horizontal line, if you can see, that upper horizontal indicates the uh, conservative target. You see? That's, a, that's kind of a bonus trade, but it's not, it's for the well-heeled trader. If you've got, you know, uh, if you have, don't have a lot of resources and can to not tolerate illiquid markets, stay away. That's uh, buyer beware. But if to the for the larger investor who has an uh, who is to some extent at least risk seeking and can tolerate a given amount of risk, I think the reward to risk ratio in this sense is a very good opportunity. I don't always see them, but here it's off the beaten path. It's not a type of uh, sector that uh, one would typically look at around this time. And as such, I thought it was appropriate, and I see a really uh, good opportunity here to make money. Now, this is the trade at the moment, the stock market slingshot. I mentioned I was, these vertical lines represent time targets. Some have passed. I also, this was the Brexit situation. This is the uh, June 27. I actually projected that, it would, I think, to the day. This was a perfect forecast. Uh, ooh, I just realized, folks, I've neglected again. That's okay. It doesn't matter. What's important is the information, but I should have put the dates in. I will indicate them. I don't, re some of these I forgot. This is June 27. Can't, this is, uh, I forgot the date, but it was a perfect top. I don't know that it was tradable, but that was clearly a good projection based on my time mechanisms and projection models. This was not so good. Eh, this was iffy. But to this one, the, the last one that's upon it that we're talking about right now, this is last Friday, November 4. I had projected that out uh, weeks, if not months ago. And those of you who have attended the previous two or three webinars, I've been talking about this for weeks, if not months. This is not, uh, it's is relatively straightforward to do. And these two lines represent the future. And again, I, for, I apologize for neglect, I forgot to put the dates on. This is November 30. This for, that's the next time point of immediate uh, concern and interest. And this is the stock market. This is the E-mini S&P, the December contract. That's one more, a vehicle, I, an instrument I trade all the time. Um, and then subsequent to that, curious, interesting day, it actually came out to, of all days, December 25. So whenever you generate a time point that happens to be on a day, and uh, for obvious reasons, the 25th is Christmas, I, you know, it's happened, Christmas this year happens to be on a Sunday, so this date represents the 26th, the day after Christmas. So I've already projected out. I've actually got a date I've worked out, and I can't, I didn't write it down, I forgot it. Um, but these two are for certain, November 30 and December 26. This is the most recent, this was this past Friday. It was a perfect projection. You can see. I didn't know it was going to be perfect. It ha Sometimes it is, sometimes it isn't. But even if it, and by the way, when I was thinking about this last week, I said to myself, well, let's put up, and in the previous webinar, I think I put on an extra line so as to indicate the window of time between Friday the 4th and Tuesday, two days ago, the 8th, because of the election. And I said, oh, that's the obvious trigger. It's a scheduled event. Everybody in the, who's every, everybody knows about it, unless you're on planet Mars somewhere. So I knew that that would be the obvious event or catalyst that would serve to create the uh, sensitivity on the market if this was correct. And I had no doubt in this case it would be. Very little. Um, I, for, I don't know why, but if you can see, I had trend lines to indicate this triangular type structure. You can see that if you can. I don't know why 
you're seeing the version that I took off the lines. But anyway, there was a triangle. And that's why when the question was put to me a few weeks ago as a panelist, number one, who's going to win the election? For which my answer is I don't know. I have an idea, but I don't know. But number two, how will the market respond? And I had, I would say, over 90% certainty as to what my, in, in my answer. And that was, well, it's what the response by the stock market, at least, will be positive. Why? Because of that triangular formation. And again, as a tenant, okay, here's your, this is going back January 20, the bottom, the lowest point on this screen. That's the date, even though it's not, you can interpolate it. Why, start of a bull market cycle, going back to a little bit of Elliott. This is wave, where's my mouse? One, two, three. You might say, well, why did they end the, you know, the critics, critics of Elliott say, you know, why did I not, why? Here's, a, here's your A, B, C of the four. And everything since this bottom, this bottom, June 27, the reason it declined, if those of you are really following stuff, that's Brexit. That was the referendum in Great Britain and the European Union, why we had such a big move. And everything since then, I believe, based on everything I'm aware of and understand, through where we are right now is a fifth wave. Well, fifth waves should subdivide, this is a, another component embedded or a detail of the theory, into five smaller scale waves. One, two, three is the all time, corresponds to the little triple top historic high in the stock market in the United States. This is the S&P. The dates are pretty much the same. This one, I think, in the middle. It, and in the high is the 2184 and change level. All time highs in the stock market. Different indices have slightly different geometric structure, whether you're looking at the Dow, the NASDAQ, the Russell, uh, SPY, etc. but more or less similar uh, geometry. And then, so that was three, and then why do I designate that triple top as the ending point of a thir little third wave inside a larger fifth? Because of the subsequent triangular pattern. Triangles most frequently show up in fourth waves regardless of the degree or size or scale. And furthermore, and this is why I had such certainty as to my forecast, 70 to 75% of the time when price is restricted in a range of rest price restriction in an extended time period in a triangular pattern or a contraction or a wedge structure, it breaks to the, in the direction that was, uh, in the same direction that was preceding the formation of the triangle. So what was the market doing, prior, more or less going up? And that's why I was so confident that the, uh, I could, from a standpoint of kind of figuring out, or infer by inference to trying to figure out, I may not know who's going to win the election, but at least I know that the response on the stock market to whoever they would win would be positive. And I clearly, <laughs> I would be, it would, I did not have any imagination we'd have this big tail of volatility. But, and go around the world. I didn't know how we would get there, but we got there. We are trading right now. Look at the triangle. You can see it coming down. These are the upper side. This top, lower top, lower top, lower top. And if you draw a line connecting those tops, you have the upper side of the triangle and this bottom to this bottom. And they, those two lines will meet in the apex of the triangle. You typically expect a breakout to occur prior to the little point. Well, what happened last week, I think by Wednesday or Thursday, it broke down below the lower side. That I chalked up as being a manifestation of how we often see the real world will deviate from this theory. I cannot expect that a market uh, the, uh, with its implicit complexities is going to perfectly obey a, tr a, a set of ideas that Elliot came up with in the 30s and 40s. That would be too much. Sometimes it does. But for me to assume that is too great an expectation. The fact that the market did what it had to do also coming into this time point this was, a, in retrospect, it was a perfect projection. Again, I didn't know that it was going to move in the way that it did. In a perfect world, it would have just come into a little tip, you know, oscillated and within ever smaller and smaller spaces, back up and down, until it broke immediately through the upper side of the triangle. Well, in this case, prior to, given the added concern that the stock market had as we got closer to the end of the week last week, for what was to come this week, it, it erred on the side of, uh, you know, uncertainty, and markets hate uncertainty. Stock markets do. They love good news. They don't like bad news, but they can't stand no news or uncertainty. And that's why you see, you saw a deviation from strict theoretical mathematical beauty. But nevertheless, 
the market reverted back to the ideal theoretical attractor. And we are currently trading at a level that's consistent with all of this precursor structure as de indicated by a very good, robust, descriptive model, Elliott, among other things. The fact that it coordinated perfectly with the time point, November, this is November 4, again, this is November 30, this is now past, that's irrelevant. Uh, I, that's not quite true, but the past can, can sometimes be helpful in interpreting the future and the present, but if you believe that. But here's my thought. This is a stock market slingshot. Look at the, for every action is a reaction. All of that, this is analogous. This big fear that pulled this market, the offer the price down, will the reaction to that will at minimum be proportional. Okay, so the market, the stock market was trading about 40 minutes ago, an hour ago, 2168. Where this last night printed slide 26, 2166, 2160 and change. We're right now about 2168. On a close above 2160, I told people today earlier today in the day session, establish long positions. Here's now your immediate head of over, your immediate zone of resistance is indicated graphically by this line. The historical triple top, 2184 area, 2180 to 84 is your immediate stopping point. So from a profit objective standpoint, if we if that's a large enough spread between where we're trading now, let's say 2168, I don't know exactly where we close because I got on with you guys. I'm not looking at another screen. It's it, my screen is across the room and I can't see it. But here's a thought: if we it, it, on a close today, which I'm pretty certain we did above 2160, I would establish long positions, assuming the spread where it, you know that spread between where we're trading at that time of entry and the 2182 area is a sufficiently large uh, return. If not, then wait for it to see how the market negotiates that 2180 to 84 area. This is a zone of, that's the first zone of re projected resistance, 2184 area. Now, if we, if you wait, or if you don't get in and it breaks through the 2184, my next price target for this market overhead, 2225. Take note, 22, 20, so again, where we're trading right now, assuming maybe 2168, 2170, I'm not sure, and on a close above 2160, I, I, am, I like the idea of establishing long positions in any major index. Again, I utilize the ES, S&P, the Dow, NASDAQ, SPY, SPX, Russell, you name it. This is generic to across the board, universally applicable. Yes, there are differences, but they are overwhelmed by the similarities of structure in time relationships. Okay, on a close. Now, also, this is just further evidence. This is of lesser importance to me, for those of you who like indicators. Notice, and I, I, I checked at least uh, 10 minutes before I uh, got on with you, the RSI standard, and uh, there's an even better way to, than overbought, oversold, than standard 70 and 30, but by the traditional standard universally accepted uh, interpretation, the RSI, we, even with the pre breakout above the upper side of the triangular configuration in stock prices, is still not in extreme overbought territory. By a more relevant interpretation, my overbought in a bull market is between 80 and 90. But even by a more conservative standard of 70, we're still below it. So I'm not going to get concerned with a long position from the standpoint of an, it being in an extreme territory based on oversold, overbought, excuse me, because we're un, less than until we cross through that threshold, number one. Number two, as of last night, this is a CCI, as, and I'm applying it as a momentum indicator. Yesterday's trade, we just had it break above the, the threshold of plus 100, which in another, based on another relationship, indicates it's more likely to persist in the same direction that it's been trading. Even now, there's some bearish stuff here. This is kind of a like a, a hanging man type structure for those uh, candle aficionados. But the trade today overwhelmed it, discounted it. Uh, I would, in fact, even if it hadn't, even if we were flat today, sideways, or down, I would still be saying everything to you, this is the trade of the moment, right now, to establish longs and equities. And your run time is between right now, or at whatever point you would establish a long position, and the next projected time point, the end of the month, November 30. Again, this is November 30, this line. I should have made that labeled. Oop, jumped the gun. And this is 
day after Christmas, December 26. So from a simplistic way, this could mean could the market could rally? It doesn't, I don't know, but it could. It gives me an indication, assuming linear proportionality, it gives me a sense as to how far this could go by extension. I don't know that. For all I know, this could be a bottom. I could be wrong. However, assuming all of these things uh, come together and coalesce and we begin to see the manifested uh, collective response that the preponderance of my evidence does indicate, it would suggest higher prices. Um, and again, my over this is my price line, the horizontal, the first line of, of, of wall of defense that could repel 20 184. If, if I like it here, if that's your, if that's consistent with your objectives of return. If it's not, wait till it see how the market negotiates the higher level of resistance at 2184. We take that out. 2225 is the next stopping point, to be precise. Basis the S and P. I can work out the. You can work out the corresponding levels given the scale of your market, but it's all the same, just different scales, different price axes calibrated differently. But the ideas and the proportionality is exactly the same. And then assuming we, how, depending on how the market exceeds or uh, behaves in response to that 2225 level, its next stopping point or profit target would be 2270. So again, the rising ladder of overhead resistance that could serve as profit project uh, uh, taking points, 2184, 2225, 2270, going from bottom to top for the stock market with a projected runtime between right now, again, more precisely from November 4, which was my last turning point last Friday through conserve. Now, I don't know, it might continue, but it might not. It's more probably going to have a change in the underlying fee componentry of the market once we arrive at or around the end of this month, November 30, and then this is the one further out that's not of immediate interest, but it will be as we move into December. Okay, and this is some additional ancillary oscillator uh, evidence to suggest and to argue for establishing long positions. That's the trade I would do right now. The specifics, again, of which should reflect the particulars that define who you are and correspondingly appropriate money management rules and guidelines. All right. A corresponding intermarket play. Is it time for gold? The gold bucks. Um, my answer is no if you're inferring or implying going long. I think it will be, but due to the close correlation, remember the earlier slide, dollar, rising dollar, pressure on commodities, buoyancy for bonds or treasuries and stocks. So to the extent the scenario that I'm projecting for stocks should fall, fall into place. If, I can, if we continue to see minimally a further buoyant, buoying up in appreciation in stock prices between now and the end of the month, I would expect that will correspond with commensurate declines in precious metals, gold and silver in particular. My, and so I've, this, is a, this is the time point. It's basically the same. They tend to be mirror image motion. Look at this is the upside down picture of the stock chart, the previous slide. It's not coincidence. They are, there's a strong capital flow in intermarket correlation. I do think we are in a bull market. I just think it's not in the strongest component por portion of it. I think there's a depreciation into the end of the month, at which point we could see a flip-flopping between sectors. Precious metals may bottom at, at, as we arrive at this point, corresponding to a, a top in equities. And that would be a, a time more appropriate, I expect, given where we are now, for establishing uh, more significant long positions in gold, silver, platinum, etc. But uh, I even I think it's a riskier play to go short. But if one did, here's here's based on price analysis. Here's my price target to the downside, just 11.97 for gold. Right, gold is trading about 10 minutes before I got on with you today, 12.58.30. So last night when I printed this chart out, we were at 1286. This chart doesn't accurately indicate today's trade. About 10 minutes before 1 Pacific time, I'm not sure we were settled, but we were trading, it had declined to 1258. So just down in here, we, had, we were down right in, just below 1260, around 1258, 10 minutes before 1 today. Here is my price target graphically illustrated by this line, just under 1200 an ounce. <clears throat> I'm projecting... Uh, my price target for gold is, <clears throat> to be precise, 1197. That's basis the December gold contract. 1197, just under the $1,200 per ounce. Is that going to be? Are we going to see that on 1130? I don't know. It's possible, clearly. 
but I don't know. But it is a price target I've generated for gold. Given if I have confidence in that, um, you would consider going short between now. And certainly I'm going to be looking for short opportunities, shorter term plays between now and the end of the month. After which I'll reconsider the long side for the metal sector. But 1197 basis to December gold. I, I trade silver because it's more volatile. But I do the analysis. I just gold is more re generally universally rep, uh, representative of the sector. So that's why I wanted to present this chart. But the time point happens to be coincident with a similar time point for the stock market. So I'm expecting whatever trend is in motion to persist more or less unabated through the end of the month, November 30. Let's see. So again, just to recap quickly. My immediate trade is this right now, given if, as long as we close, and I'm pretty sure, without looking at the screen at the moment, we closed above uh, 2160 in the uh, E-mini S&P. On that close, again, with the idea, with the notion that we could run into overhead resistance 21, between 2182 and 2184. If that distance between where we are right now and the 2182 level is wide enough spread of potential return to justify your objectives of return, I would like the opportunity. If it's not, wait to see if we can take out the historical, currently his, the all-time highs. If so, on that, on a breaking, and, and as long as the oscillators are conforming, again, all bets are off assuming we're in overbought territory. We're not there. So, and that's not the case even with the current higher prices that we saw today. Okay. This, now, if we move into extreme oscillator overbought conditions, then I would probably wait for a pullback. Assuming that's not the case, and it's not, it wasn't at least when I got on with you today, I like the opportunity to do it. That's the trade of the moment. Uh, for those people that I consult uh, day in and day out through my duties in, in teaching and mentoring with Pacific Trading, I, I generate signals and I send them to the people that I talk to and teach and work with and, and consult as to when I would establish long positions relative to the earlier slides in today's presentation. So that's a contingency trade. But just by quick reminder, assuming assuming we see or on, once I get I started to see price action sufficient to raise my, os, my standard fare of oscillators out of extreme oversold territory, I am inclined to establish long positions in the T-notes, in the T-node market, because of this obvious significant COT relationship in the note market. And considering the fact that the Fed is not going to raise rates till another six weeks or so, the middle of December. Um, now, if I'm wrong, uh, I, the filtering will prevent me from getting on board a losing uh, a, a, in, a, in alignment with a trend that's not going to generate a return. But the traders that I consult will get the signal, and if there are any questions, you can contact me accordingly. And that's a trade. And then for those of you who have an appetite for risk and uh, relative to a good bang for buck, I like the long position, my price target in, in the OJ. Um, if only for those, this, and even if there is an ETF for this, I would not do it. But for those who trade derivatives and uh, have uh, a resource and a, an account uh, and tolerance for risk. Uh, I think the bang to buck ratio is very good. We're trading currently 216.80. Um, my target is 235 in the OJ. And again, the current trade, I would the green light to generate a buy signal currently is long positions in stock market. If you're trading options, um, go out at least 45 days expiry. 45 to 60 days. Given the time window here, I expect at least. Now it could go longer. Time points, November 30, December 26 again, they indicate underlying change. One, the most obvious change is an outright 180 degree shift of, of direction. But it could be that the market consolidates and continues into the end of the year. Vis relative to that uh, end of year, or what do you call it, the uh, Santa Claus rally, whatever. Or not, we'll see. But at least I expect overall the trend that has been uh, in motion for the last day and a half now, I expect will persist at least through the end of the um, a month. All right. Folks, if you have any, uh, let's see, if there are any questions, SPY closed today, 216. Uh, thank you, Ron. Okay. Any other questions? I don't think so. Excellent. Excellent, guys. If you have questions, I'll spend five minutes on questions. While, if you're maybe, um, but those are the ideas that I like at the moment. Um, I, there are many others. What is a bond ETF we can trade? A very Oh, sure. TLT, Tom, Larry, Tom is the symbol, uh, TRA, who, uh, the person who's asking it. 
ES2164.9. I thank you, Ron, for that update. I, I would be a stat, I wouldn't, it depends, again, the details, you know, uh, but a cheaper one, um, TRA, I don't, good question. I know that there's TLT, because I don't, as a rule, I don't trade um, ETFs. I'd have to check on that. I honestly don't know. I know that, T, what I do know about TLT is pretty liquid, and as, of, as such, it's safe, and the options are pretty uh, fairly priced. There's a good amount of open interest and volume in TLT. TBT, I believe, is the, you, it, uh, you buy it if you ex if you're bearish. I believe it's the contra fund. Um, there, there, are, yeah. TBT is the inverse. Uh, TLT. There may be others. I just may, I'm just not familiar with them. I would have to uh, do some uh, do an ETF. You know, an ETF uh, uh, search on that. But I know TLT. A number of the people that I work with who trade ETFs uh, trade um, TLT when I do a trade in an interest rate vehicle or a market or instrument. Um, okay, any other questions, guys? Um, again, if folks, if you have questions uh, concerning any of the topics or you'd like more detail, uh, you can contact, uh, get a hold of me sometimes via Peter Newman. He is uh, kind of our head of admissions and handles a lot of the internal uh, policies and in admissions. He's their contact person. Some of you are familiar with him. If you're not, he's the one to talk to or request when you contact us at the number you at the inf information you see on your screen, um, you can also uh, ask about getting a copy. I'm not sure. It might be our policy that the computer department sends out a tape or a recording of uh, all of our uh, presentations to anyone who subscribes, whether you've made it to the presentation or not. But um, if you don't get it, you can always inquire utilizing the contact information here on the screen. Um, yeah. So I guess that's it. Any other questions? I don't see any. Okay. Well, folks, again, it's, um, yeah, if there are any other questions, you not get a hold of uh, me at least indirectly through or via PTA, Pacific Trading Academy. Um, if not, until next time, but I wish you, you know, hopefully you got something out of it and um, clearly, uh, upward and onward and uh, wishing you the best in terms of a day and uh, in the days to come profitable trading until next time have a great one let's see